Himmlischer Vater, wir wollen stille werden. Wir beten dich an und bitten dich um deinen Heiligen Geist. Dear Father in Heaven, we want to become silent before you. We want to worship you and ask for your Holy Spirit. Ich bitte dich, dass du Jeff segnest. We ask your blessings for Jeff. Und wir denken auch an unsere Geschwister in Europa. And we also think of our brethren and sisters in Europe. Zu Hause hat der Sabbat bereits angefangen. Where Sabbath has already begun. Segne auch sie bitte. Please bless them as well. Im Namen Jesu. Amen. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We're um, already into the study that we titled Power, Seat and Authority. Um, one thing that I want to go back into the last study and just remind us of, the last study was the three Elijahs, and one of the themes in the three Elijahs that we need to understand is that the promise of Malachi is that Elijah would come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and Elijah came before the day of the Lord in the time period of John the Baptist, and uh, he comes at the end of the world through his people. And by identifying the struggle that Elijah and John the Baptist were in, we can more clearly identify the powers that we're dealing with here at the end. And for the whole time I've been an Adventist, I've read books and magazines and articles on the Elijah message. We, it's, it's something we're familiar with, the Seventh-day Adventists, that we're part of the Elijah message at the end of the world. So I would submit to you that from a prophetic aspect, not so much as the information that we find in Elijah and John the Baptist, one of the truths of the Elijah message at the end of the world is established in that the story of Elijah, John the Baptist, and the 144,000, that being that one of the prophetic principles that will have significance to God's people at the end of the world is what we're calling here, and there may be a better name for it, a triple application of prophecy. Uh, you can find a, you know, a handful of prophecies in God's Word um, that clearly have three uh, direct fulfillments. Uh, abomination of Desolation was fulfilled in 87 with pagan Rome uh, as uh, the power of Rome, the symbol of Rome's power was um, placed in the holy place, placed where it should not be. We see the Abomination of Desolation um, in the papal power um, when paganism is placed in the Christian church, in the holy place, where it should not be. And Sister White uses the Abomination of Desolation to illustrate the end of the world. Um, when the Sunday law arrives, once again, the power of Rome in a place where it should not be. And the point is, is in those three illustrations, simplified down to their lowest common denominator, the abomination of desolation is the mark of Rome's authority placed where it should not be. The first two times, 80, 70. The second time, the papacy, 538 um, to 1798. Those characteristics tell us the story of the third time, the abomination of desolation. The, the mark of Rome's authority is placed where it should not be. And the, it is the same with Elijah the first and John the Baptist, illustrating the struggle of the 144,000 at the end of the world. What I'm saying is, is, is recognizing this principle in Bible prophecy um, becomes more important as you approach the study of the three woes, um, because it gives you uh, the, the principle you need to have confidence that in the first and second woe, we see illustrated the third woe. And I believe in, in, that is a rule um, that God's people will come to understand that is part of what we would call the overall Elijah message, just as William Miller was used to establish a certain set of rules of Bible prophecy that contributed to the present truth message of his day and age. Now, what we're dealing with here, we're moving into a, a new angle on the, the three powers that go to make up uh, modern Babylon, the beast, dragon, and false prophet. I acknowledge out front, this is more of a theor theoretical um, recognition of these uh, three powers, because this is not really three powers portrayed by enemies of God's people, but it is... Um, three of the, the primary characteristics that exist within these three powers at the end of the world. This is a, a, 
a passage of inspiration that just broadens our understanding of the different roles of the beast, dragon, and false prophet. We began um, by looking at the power, um, military power. We know one of these powers supplies military power at the end and forces the whole world to worship the beast in his image. And we know that there is going to be a civil authority established, and uh, that is illustrated by Ahab and Herod, among other places. And sure enough, one of the things that pagan Rome gave to the papacy was authority, along with power, and seat. So that's what we're looking at at this point, and we'll continue on. Um, now, God has a controversy with the world, and this is the end of, let's back up, this is the end of that quote. Um, kings, governors, and rulers have placed upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon. Whoever the dragon is at the end of the world, because this is definitely in the Sunday Law Crisis time period, what, what symbolizes the dragon at the end of the world is kings, rulers, and governors, and as we've mentioned a couple times, each of these powers of Bible prophecy, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, they all have two aspects to who and what they are in Bible prophecy, a religious aspect, a political aspect, most often as Seventh-day Adventists, we understand the dragon power at the end of the world is spiritualism. That is the dragon power. That's its spiritual aspect. The political aspect of the dragon power at the end of the world are a group of politicians, kings, governors, rulers, in plural, have placed upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon. God has a controversy, this is the same quote, God has a controversy with the world. God will call the world to account for the death of his only begotten son. Now, now, please pay attention to this because she's talking about the kings, governors, and rulers that are the dragon power at the end of the world. And one of the things she says about them is that they are going to be guilty of crucifying Christ. And she's going to tell us how this is the case. And when we get into Revelation 17, we're going to see that the ten kings make war against Christ. And this is, a, this is some expanded information on how the ten kings make war against Christ in Revelation 17. God will call the world to account for the death of his only begotten Son, whom to all intents and purposes the world has crucified afresh and put to open shame in the persecution of his people. The world has rejected Christ in the person of his saints, has refused his messages in the refusal of the messages of prophets, apostles, and messengers. They have rejected those who have been co-laborers with Christ, and for this they will have to render account. Revelation 17, 12 through 14, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. At the end of time, Revelation 17 says, The ten kings are the ones that make war with Christ. Sister White says, Kings, governors, and rulers that have placed upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon make war on Christ through his people. Same, same symbol. Now, if you begin to look at the dragon power in Bible prophecy, you, ultimately you will come across Isaiah 8. Isaiah 8 talks about an evil confederacy. And, uh, and when you begin to pull together um, what Sister White says about Isaiah 8, if you run the CD-ROM, she gives us the characteristics of who this power is, and one of the characteristics is that it is a confederacy. A confederacy, a group, a group. This isn't a single entity. This is a confederacy, which I would suggest to you is symbolized by the ten kings of Revelation 17 um, for more than one reason, but let's, let's move on. The powers of Satan are mustering for battle. Stern conflicts are before us. Press together, my brethren and sisters, press together. Bind up with Christ. Say ye not a confederacy, Isaiah 8, 12 through 15 quoted. Now, brothers and sisters, if you're listening carefully, what I'm going to suggest here as we go through this, I'm going to suggest that the United Nations is the organization that encompasses these ten kings that are symbolized in Revelation 17, and I'm going to suggest that these ten kings are also this evil confederacy of Isaiah 8. If this is so... None of us should be associating with the United Nations. I am instructed to say that those who know the truth, Isaiah 8, 13 through 20, quoted. After she quotes Isaiah 8, 13 through 20, let's read that. 
Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And he shall be a, for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall, and be broken and snared, and be snared, and be taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. Now, the reason I wanted to read this is for this verse right here. When is the law sealed among his disciples? It's, it's here. She's played, this passage here is brought down to the Sunday law time period. And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. And uh, when they say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead, to the law and the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Now, in Isaiah here, he's talking about a confederacy and he's specifically tying this confederacy into the religion of spiritualism. Now, we all know where the, the home of the United Nations is, is don't we? New York. New York City. Uh, do you know where one of the main centers of uh, the publishing center for the New Age movement is found? It's in the New United Nations building in New York City. Is the, uh, what used to be called uh, the Lucifer Press, but it was changed to Lucis Trust um, is there. So uh, you, there, there's no way you can't get the connections of the New Age movement with the United Nations, if you will look. And that's just, that's a, that's a really simple one. But in any case, she just quotes Isaiah 8, 13 to 20, this evil confederacy at the end of the world. Each of the ancient prophets spoke more for the end of the world than the day in which they lived. And Sister White is certainly applying this to the end of the world because she then quotes Revelation 16. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked without the robe of Christ's righteousness, and they see his shame. These subjects are of utmost importance. Urge our people to consider them carefully. What subjects? The subject of who this evil confederacy is? What kind of connection does it have with spiritualism? What kind of connection does it have with the beast, dragon, and false prophet? Ur urge the people to consider this carefully. When they do this, their mind will be so fully occupied with matters of eternal consequence that they will lose sight of the little differences that once annoyed them. They will realize that prophecy is even now fulfilling. If the minds of the people of God were not occupied with things of minor consequence, they would see that the signs of times are fast fulfilling and that the events of the greatest consequence to them are taking place in the world and in churches pointed out by the words, Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. Consider them carefully. The so-called Christian world is to be the theater of great and decisive actions. There, I had a brother in California email me recently, and he says, what's your uh, reasoning for believing that at the collapse of the Soviet Union that atheism had fallen, and uh, how do you justify not seeing communism in China? And uh, how do you relate to uh, uh, India in terms of Bible prophecy and my response to him and the response that I want to put on record here is if you look very carefully in the writings of Spirit of Prophecy, Sister White defines an area called Christendom and if you look on the CD-ROM what she sets forth the de definition of Christendom, um, Europe and the Americas is a, is a basic summary of Christendom and in Old Testament times the focus of Bible prophecy was the Middle East. Uh, Palestine and her neighbors. That's where Old Testament Bible pro prophecy is portrayed. And at the end of the world, Bible prophecy is portrayed in here what she calls the so-called Christian world. Now, it doesn't mean that China and India will not be involved because she tells us very plainly, and the Bible teaches this too, that every nation will be involved. But in terms of applying the prophetic symbols, the theater that the Lord has set forth for us to apply Bible prophecy is Christendom, the so-called Christian world. The so-called Christian world is the th to be the theater of great and decisive actions. Men in authority, men in authority, here she's emphasizing 
authority will enact laws controlling the conscience and after the, after the example of the papacy, Babylon will make all nations, not some nations, all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Every nation will be involved. Of this time, John the Revelator declares, Revelation 18, 3 through 7 quoted, These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. We're dealing with the dragon power and the evil confederacy of Isaiah 8. In the warfare to be waged in the last days, there will be united in opposition to God's people all the corrupt powers that have apostatized from the allegiance to the law of Jehovah. In this warfare, the Sabbath of the fourth commandment will be the great point of issue. For this, in the Sabbath commandment, the great lawgiver identifies himself as the creator of heavens and earth. As we go through Revelation 17, some of the arguments that are out there about Revelation 17 limit the symbols in Revelation 17. To, to, let's say some of them would tell you that the ten horns are representing uh, the European nations. Well, brothers and sisters, all the way through inspiration is telling us that this final uh, war that takes place between the beast dragon, false prophet, and God's people is worldwide. It's universal. It's not um, Europe. It's every nation will be involved and all the corrupt powers will be brought into this um, time period. Now, um, there are certain prophetic events that are more singular in, nation, in, in nature. I don't know if, if I'm conveying that the best way it can be conveyed, but at, for instance, you see up there on the board, 330, that is identifying the year 330, when the seat of pagan Rome was given to papal Rome. It was a, a singular event. Uh, and sometimes in Bible prophecy, Prophecies are emphasizing a singular event, although I don't think any event in Bible prophecy is not related to other events, but the emphasis sometimes on Bible prophecy is a singular event. But sometimes Bible prophecy is identifying a progression of events, and this is the, in the case of what we have up here, power. We're, we're looking at Revelation 13.2, where pagan Rome gave its power, seat, and authority to papal Rome. And each of those historical events is represented up there. Uh, the pioneers were, were, uh, dwelt on these dates quite a bit. I don't think the pioneers, w I, I, to be fair, if you haven't looked at the pioneers, I do not think the pioneers put the same emphasis on some of this as I am making, because many times as I read their writings, um, they, they kind of blend power and authority, and I'm making a distinction that normally they're not making. I'm suggesting that the power is the military power, um, and there is a distinction to be made. I'll give you an example. Since the Iraq War, uh, they have set up an Iraqi government. Iraq has a civil authority. But what are, what's the United States attempting to do right now? It's trying to build up the Iraqi army so the Iraqi or army can uphold the civil government of Iraq on its own and the American troops can go home. The point is, is that a civil power needs, a civil authority needs some kind of power, military or police power, whatever you want to call it, to enforce its civil legislation. So there is a difference. The pioneers generally combine these two, uh, but inspiration separates them out when it says that pagan Rome gave its power and its seat and its great authority, and that's what we're doing here. And on power, I'm suggesting to you that this isn't so much a singular event in Bible prophecy, but the giving of the power, the military strength, the arms to the papacy is a process that began in the year 496 and continued till the year 508 and beyond, and beyond. I am not denying that uh, the Goths still had to be removed out of the city of Rome, uh, which took place in 538, and I'm not denying that during the Dark Ages, the papacy used those armies of Europe to continue to control the world, but in terms of uh, Revelation 13.2, um, identifying the three things that pagan Rome gave to the papacy uh, in connection with the three things that pagan Rome removed for the papacy, 
These are the histories that symbolize the power, seat, and authority, and the power is a progression. It began in 496 when Clovis converted to Catholicism, and then one by one the seven European kings bowed to Rome, and the last of which was England in the year 508. And in 1996, Pope John Paul II made a pilgrimage or a, a trip to France to celebrate 1,500 years since Clovis converted to his Catholicism, Seventh-day Adventist Catholicism. Seventh-day Adventists, this group does, but your typical Seventh-day Adventist uh, doesn't remember what 496 is all about or who Clovis was or, or have any idea what it means, but the papacy knows what it means. And this article here is from the Na um, National Catholic Register, and uh, this is a Catholic publication that was pre printed um, in the 1996 time period, talking about the trip that John Paul II was going to make to France. It says, John Paul II is coming to France this month, his fifth visit since becoming Pope in 1978, to celebrate the 15th centenary of the baptism of Clovis, the first Western Christian king and founder of the modern French nation. It was as a result of that baptism, traditionally believed to have taken place in Reims in 496, that France glories in the title of eldest daughter of the church was in Reims that Clovis, pagan leader of the Salian Franks, was baptized by St. Remy, the Bishop of Reims, in the presence of all the king's nobles. He was to give France, then still known as Gaul, its name, its capital, its first royal dynasty, the Merovians, Merovingians, named after his grandfather Merovec, and its official faith. He was going to give him his, its official faith, Catholicism. Some have suggested that Clovis' baptism was also the baptism of France. The king's baptism did, however, mark the first official recognition of Christianity in a country still dominated by paganism and Arianism, the early Christian heresy which denied the divinity of Christ. The history of France and of Europe, and indeed the history of the Catholic Church, would have not been the same if the baptism had not taken place. Celebrating Clovis' baptism endorses the traditional view that his conversion marked the actual founding of France. By celebrating the baptism of Clovis, the French Republic is unilaterally endorsing a certain Christian image of France, he wrote. To remember Clovis is to recall monarchy, religious, and divine rights of kings. Shortly after establishing himself as king, Clovis fell in love with and married Clotilde, a beautiful Burgundian princess who had been left a penniless orphan after the brutal murder of her parents by her wicked uncle, the king of Burgundy. A devout Catholic, Clotilde was to play a key role in her pagan husband's conversion to Christianity. According to tradition, Clovis' spiritual turning point came in 496 during the Battle of Tobiac against the Alemanni, another invading Germanic tribe. When all appeared lost for the Franks, Clovis raised his eyes to the heavens and cried out, God of Clotilde, if you, will gi if you give me victory, I will become a Christian. The Alemanni turned and fled. Not long after this, during Clovis' baptism, a second miracle reportedly occurred. The baptizing priest who had been sent to bring the holy oil to the baptistry was unable to push his way back through the hordes of Clovis' Frankish warriors crowding around the cathedral. The situation was saved by the sudden arrival of a white dove, which is, was seen to descend with the holy vial, which it carefully placed in Clovis' hands. In the 25 years of his reign, Clovis managed to drive off the waves of barbarians, barbarian invaders and greatly extended his realm's boundaries to the east and south, consolidating his power through an alliance with the church. It is not yet known whether French President Jacques Chirac, who will meet the Pope upon his arrival in France on September 19th, will attend the anniversary celebration of Clovis' baptism three days later in Reims Cathedral. He may now consider it politically ill-advised. But there is little doubt that his predecessor and political mentor, Charles de Gaulle, would have done, gone. For me, de Gaulle said, the history of France begins with Clovis. My country is Christian, and I begin to count the history of France from the arrival of a Christian king bearing the name of the Franks. The Catholics understand that the first of the seven European kings that formed an alliance with the papacy was in 496, and from 496 to 508, there was a process of bowing down to the papacy, and in the bowing down, there was a change of profession and a supply of military strength given to the papacy. And I, I submit to you that this history, that uh, Clovis um, represents the United States in general 
and the Reagan years in a more specific sense. The seat. The next symbol, this is Uriah Smith, I assume. The next symbol to engage our attention is the leopard beast of chapter 13 to which the dragon gives his seat, his power, and great authority. It would be sufficient on this point to show to what power the dragon pagan Rome transferred its seat and gave its power. The seat of any government is certainly its capital city. The city of Rome was the dragon seat, but in AD 330, Constantine transferred the seat of the empire from Rome to Constantinople, and Rome was given to what? To, de to decay, desolation, and ruin? No, but to become far more celebrated than it had ever been before, not as the seat of pagan emperors, but as the city of St. Peter's successors, the seat of a spiritual hierarchy which was not only to become more powerful than any secular prince, but through the magic of its fatal sorcery was to exercise dominion over the kings of the earth. Thus was Rome given to the papacy, and the decree of Justinian in, issued in 533 and carried into effect in 538, constituting the pope the head of all the churches and the corrector of heretics, was the investing of the papacy with the power and authority which the prophet foresaw. So you have in there, 330 is when the seat was given to the papacy, 533, the civil authority, although history identifies they didn't begin to exercise it until the Goths were driven from the city of Rome. Authority, 533 through 538. Now in 533, this question was raised again and Justinian became involved in the dispute. This time, one set of monks argued that if one of the Trinity did not suffer on the cross, then one of the Trinity was not born of the Virgin Mary and therefore she ought no longer to be called the mother of God. That's a good idea. Others argued if one of the Trinity did not suffer on the cross, then Christ who suffered was not one of the Trinity. Justinian entered the list against both and declared that Mary was truly the mother of God, that Christ was in the strictest sense one of the Trinity, and that whosoever denied either the one or the other was a heretic. This frightened the monks because they knew Justinian's opinions on the subject of heretics were exceedingly forcible. They therefore sent off two of their number to lay the question before the Pope. As soon as Justinian learned this, he too decided to apply to the Pope. He therefore drew up a confession of faith that one of the Trinity suffered in the flesh and sent it by two bishops to the Bishop of Rome. To make his side of the question appear as favorable as possible to the Pope, Justinian sent a rich present of chalices and other vessels of gold enriched with precious stones and the following flattering letter. Justinian, pious, fortunate, renowned, triumphant emperor, consul, etc., to John, the most holy archbishop of our city of Rome and patriarch, Rending honor to the apostolic chair and to your holiness, as has always been and always is and is our wish, and honoring your blessedness as a father, we have hastened to bring to the knowledge of your holiness all matters relating to the state of the churches. It having been at all times our great desire to preserve the unity of your apostolic chair and the constitution of holy churches of God, which has obtained hitherto and still obtains, Therefore, we have made no delay in subjecting and uniting to your holiness all the priests of the whole East. For this reason, we have thought fit to bring to your notice the present matters of disturbance, religious disturbance, though they are manifest and unquestionable and always firmly held and declared by the whole priesthood according to the doctrine of your apostolic chair, for we cannot suffer that anything which relates to the state of the church, however manifest and unquestionable, should be moved without the knowledge of your holiness, who are the head of all the holy churches. For in all things we have already declared we are anxious to increase the honor and authority of your apostolic chair. It is true that Justinian wrote these words with no such far-reaching meaning, but that made no difference. The words were written, and like all other words of similar import, they could be and were made to bear whatever meaning the Bishop of Rome should choose to find in them. Therefore, the year 538, which marks the conquest of Italy, the deliverance of Rome, and the destruction of the kingdom of the Ostrogoths is the true date which marks the establishment of the temporal authority of the papacy and the exercise of that authority as a world power. All that was ever done later in this connection was but to enlarge by additional usurpations and donations the territory which the Bishop of Rome at this point possessed and over which he asserted civil jurisdiction. 
Then began the fatal policy of the Roman Sea because she was then herself a world power possessing temporalities over which she both claimed and exercised dominion and by virtue of which she could contend with other dominions and upon the same level. And that which made the papacy so much the more domineering in this, in this fatal policy was the fact of Justinian having so fully committed himself when the mightiest emperor who had ever sat on the eastern throne had not only under his own hand rendered, rendered such decided homage. What's homage mean? It means, it means when you undress yourself and bow down and let the king clasp your hand. When the mightiest emperor who had ever sat on the, throne, on the eastern throne had not only under his own hand rendered such decided homage to the papacy, but had rooted out the last power that stood in her way, this to her was strongly justifiable ground for her assertion of dominion over all other dominions and her disputing dominion with the powers of the earth. A.T. Jones, Ecclesiastical Man Empire, 202-208. The pioneers were familiar with these histories. And rightly so, this is what they were studying, the books of Daniel and Revelation. But the pioneers were uh, expecting all things to come to a conclusion by 1843 and then 1844. So as much as they knew about these dates, which is valid and important historical information for us to go consider, um, they weren't making applications to these histories down at the end of the world. But we have hindsight to work with us. And these histories are illustrating the dynamics uh, of modern Rome. Why do I say that? Based upon a triple application of prophecy. Uh, pagan Rome and Papal Rome together, those two histories, are the history of Rome and they're illustrating and identifying the characteristics of modern Rome. There's only one caveat, I think that's the right word to that, is that um, in both Pagan and Papal Rome we have time prophecies on how long they would rule the world supremely. But inspiration clearly and purposely tells us that as of 1844, time should be no longer. So the characteristics of pagan and papal Rome that possess time prophecies are not um, applied here down at the end of the world. But the rest are. Signs of the time, November 1st, 1899. But the stern tracing of the prophetic pencil reveals a change in this peaceful scene. The beast with the lamb-like horns speaks with the voice of a dragon and exercises all the power of the first beast before him. What's the power? What's the power that was given to the papacy? It was the military power from 496 to 408. Why did she need military power? She needed to do what? Remove the three horns. And at the end of the world, there's going to be once again a, uh, a military power that comes to the aid of the papacy. For what purpose? To remove the three horns of the king of the south, the glorious land, and Egypt. This history has a bearing on the end of the world, and we've read a passage from Manus script release, referred to it several times already, where Sister White specifically takes this history of verses 30 and 31 and onward and says, scenes similar to those described in these words will take place, and that history of verse 30 and 31 of Daniel 11 is the history that encompasses these three histories. Um, you, you might say, you might argue that the year 330 um, was outside of verses 30 to 31, but it's surely, surely connected to it. Um, but in any case, the beast with the lamb-like horn speaks with the voice of the dragon, exercises all the power of the first beast before him. Prophecy declares that he will say to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, and that he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Thus, Protestantism follows in the steps of the papacy. Revelation 13 through 11 through 17 identifies that uh, it's the United States, as we understand it correctly, that is the power at the end of the world, um, that is the prophetic power at the end of the world that will exercise military power, and through the exercise of its two horns of strength, economic and military power, it will deceive the world. It will do its dance of deception. Its dance of deception isn't a, a literal dance in front of King Herod, and it's not a literal dance like the priest of Baal at the foot of Mount Carmel. 
the, the dance of the United States, according to Revelation 11, 13, 11 through 17, is symbolizing the two strengths of the United States at the end of the world that it uses to force the whole world to bow down to Rome. And those two strengths are military and economic strength. So I'm suggesting to you that the power at the end is the USA. And we're going, suggesting to you that the one that's going to set, be seated on this threefold union is the papacy. And I know that uh, this causes some, a little bit of sh shaking here, but we're also suggesting that the civil authority at the end of the world is the United Nations. This isn't an argument for the United Nations, what I'm going to say here. But it is an argument, and it's this. There's evidences all over the place that we're at the end of the world. Once you realize that there is going to be a worldwide civil authority placed at the end of time, then this isn't an argument. But this is a logical argument, strictly human logical argument. There isn't enough time to structure another world civil government to replace the United Nations, brethren. We're at the end. The, this is the civil power that is in place here and now. It's the United Nations. There isn't enough time to, to deconstruct the United Nations and raise up another one world government. This is the one. But we're, we're going to bring evidence to bear anyway. But that's, that's just the logic of where we are at the end of time. So the woman is the one that seats. The great whore that sitteth upon many waters, a woman set upon a scarlet-colored beast. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman setteth. The waters which thou saw where the whore setteth. This woman of Revelation 17, one of the characteristics of the woman of Revelation 17 that we've already read, where it's a great controversy, Sister White says, is the papacy. One of the characteristics of the papacy is she's the one that is seated. And another passage from Revelation 17 is, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city, that kingdom, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Uh, this woman, the papacy, is in control of a plurality of kings over the whole earth. And then we have Testimonies, Volume 7, 182. Yet under one head, the papal power, the people will unite to oppose God in the person of his witnesses. So what are we saying? Among other things, by using the history of power, seat, and authority, we are adding to our understanding of modern Babylon. If we take this history, I'm going to walk over here. If we take this history and we bring these three powers over here where we all already have them listed, Revelation 13, 2, seat, authority, and power, what this, these three histories are teaching us is that of the beast, the dragon, and false prophet, which one of these are in control of everything? It's the beast. It's the Vatican. It's the papacy. It's the one that's on top of all three. That's, what, that's one of the many things that these three histories allow us to recognize. Civil authority. This, these are... Uh, this is from Revelation 17. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. What is fornication? In the Bible, it's an unlawful relationship. In prophetic terms, what's the unlawful relationship of Bible prophecy? Combination of church and state. Um, and this is from Revelation 17. Now, in the story of Elijah and John the Baptist, what was the unlawful relationship? It was that Ahab, the civil power, was not to be married to Jezebel. And it was that Herod was not to be married to his brother's wife. Unlawful relationship. The unlawful relationship at the end of the world is between the impure woman, the church, and the civil authority. That's where the unlawful relationship takes place. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. Here's a plurality of kings in Revelation 17. Remember, Sister White says, 
uh, that the dragon power at the end of the world is kings, governors, and rulers, a plurality of political leaders. Ten kings which have received no kingdom. How many kingdoms do these ten kings receive? One kingdom. It's singular. They have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. When they, do, when they are empowered on their birthday, do they rule alone? No, they rule for a short period of time with the beast. Who's the beast? The papacy. Revelation 16 and 17. So they're going to rule for a short period of time mutually. These have one mind. These ten kings are in agreement. They have one mind and shall give their, they're going to give their power and strength unto the papacy. But these ten kings, they will also make war with the Lamb. And at the same time, this question came up between this meeting and our last meeting. The ten horns shall hate the whore and make her desolate and naked and shall eat her with her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree. Now notice, they agree, there's an agreement struck. They agree and give their kingdom unto the beast. There's some kind of agreement struck uh, between all three of these players, the beast, dragon, and false prophet, because Bible prophecy teaches very clearly in the Bible and spirit of prophecy that it's a threefold union. There's an agreement struck that when these ten kings received their kingdom, which in Revelation 17, 17 is the seventh kingdom, that at the same time they're going to give their kingdom unto the papacy. They're going to co-rule for a short period of time. But backing up, it says that these ten horns shall hate the, the whore and make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. And we've read some quotes where Sister White says things like we should learn to trace uh, their working through history and prophecy. We're, we're to learn to trace the, his, the prophetic history of the powers that are involved with this struggle from the beginning to the end. And once you conclude that the civil authority that comes into a relationship with the Vatican at the end of the world and that they are forced to do so by the power of the United States, once you see that, then you can dive into the history of the United Nations. And it's very easy to document uh, the history of the United Nations back to the 11th century at least. I mean, there's people that can take it back farther. But it's very e sound and safe history to go back um, to the 11th century and th the time period of what is known as the Knights of the Templar. And if you go back to the history of the Knights of the Templar, um, they were an order in the Catholic Church that primarily were taking pilgrims from Europe, not pilgrims, warriors, um, what did they call them? Crusaders from Europe to the Middle East to fight in the Crusades. And the Knights of the Templar would charge you know, travel fare to take the crusaders back and forth, and they became very wealthy doing this. And uh, at that time, Europe was becoming in poverty, and poverty, poverty, poverty just kept getting worse because the Catholic Church was robbing everything in Europe to pay for the crusades, and the only one that was getting rich were the Knights of the Templar, and they would take their, their finances, and they began buying up the castles in Europe, and I need my notes to give you the figures, but this is, this is, I hope we all know this, this is easy to see, find in history. Came a point, I forget, there came a point in time where the Knights of the Templar owned like something like 10,000, over 10,000 different castles in Europe, which created a problem for them. If you're going to have 10,000 castles, it's kind of like having maybe 10,000 motels. Sooner or later, you need to start doing repair on the motels to keep them up. And during that time period, they came into connection with the people that repaired castles. And who, who repairs castles? Masons, bricklayers, the first um, unionized people in history. So there was an alliance formed early on. But in this process of becoming richer and richer, the, the byword, the, the motto of the Knights of the Templar that is historically documented is that if you can own the wealth of the world, you can own the world. And they began to uh, work upon that motto. And they set their headquarters up in the Middle East in uh, a, a place where Solomon's temple was, where his stables used to be. And that's why they became known as the Knights of the Templar. 
And during that time period, if you remember um, that John, the disciple John, in his writings, one of the things that he dealt with in his writings was the teaching of Gnosticism that was prevalent um, right in the time period of the Apostle John. And so much of his writing is dealing with Gnosticism. Gnosticism was, was being raised up right at the very birth um, time of Christianity. And therefore, a thousand years later, when the Knights of the Templar are in the Middle East, Gnosticism, Gnosticism has a strong foothold. And history says that while they were there, the Knights of the Templar accepted this spiritualistic religion and they kept it secret because it was not in agreement with Catholicism. And moving very quickly through this history. But there came a time in history, long time after the birthplace of the Knights of the Templar, when the King of France became aware that the Knights of the Templar weren't genuine Catholics. So he blew the whistle on the Knights of the Templar and he told the Pope of Rome that these men are practicing Gnosticism. They're not genuine Catholics. And at first, the Pope was unwilling to deal with them because they were the strongest, wealthiest people in Europe. But the King of France insisted. And three years later, the Pope called an inquisition on the Knights of the Templar. And uh, they went out and ran, rounded up as many as they could, but almost all of them fled. They got away. Somebody forewarned them. And they took much of their wealth with, with them, and they disappeared to a place that at that time in history was off the modern map, a place called Scotland. And if you go to Scotland today, you can go back to uh, the towns that go back to that very date that the Inquisition was called on the Knights of the Templar, and you can find graveyards and towns that are, that are named Temple Glen and Temple Hill and Temple this and Temple that. And as you go to the old graveyards from that time period, you can see the gravestones with the Knights of the Templars' um, style of burying uh, themselves was, which was simply to take the sword of the Knights of the Templar and chisel the outline of the sword. That was how they marked their gravestones. No name or anything, just outline their sword. So you, history documents that at the time of that Inquisition, the Knights of the Templar fled to Scotland and got away. And at that time, that was, that was like from here to the South Pole. They were out of the reach of the, the papacy. They were out of the reach of France. But they weren't happy. They weren't happy. And so when you get to the French Revolution time period, by the way, the head of the Knights of the Templar at that time was a, called a, a guy named Jacques de Molay. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But in masonry today, they have a special order of de Molay. That's commemorating uh, that Jacques de Molay, who was burned at the stake from that inquisition. But in any case, uh, there came a time period, a few hundred years later, when the Knights of the Templar, well, not the Knights of the Templar, but a new order of Scottish Freemasonry moved from England into France and connected with um, who you were mentioning today, Adam Weishaupt and those people, and history attests that they contributed and brought about what is known as the French Revolution. And what happened in the French Revolution? One of the things that happened is, is the royalty of France was overthrown. <laughs> That was retaliation for, from the Knights of the Templar for uh, the King of France blowing the whistle on the Knights of the Templar. And once the French Revolution took place and the, the Knights of the Templar had accomplished what they wanted to accomplish, what then happened? Napoleon sent his general to take the Pope captive. That was the Knights of the Templar retaliating against France and the Pope of Rome. And those men are still in the world today and their hatred against the papacy and the papacy's hatred of them goes back at least a thousand years. Amen. And it's documented in history. So when you see that the United Nations is built upon Freemasonry and acknowledges it and it goes back down that line, then you understand this historical hatred of this Freemasonry that we know as the United Nations. So when we get to the end of the world and this forced alliance has taken place and suddenly the Euphrates dries up and the whole, all of mankind realize that they've been deceived by the whore of Rome and then Revelation 17 says these ten kings turn on her and burn her with fire and eat her flesh. It's consistent with their historic antagonism that they've had for hundreds of years and that's one of the reasons Sister White says we should, the guardians of the flock of God should teach the people that the spiritual powers are in controversy. 
And if you go back into the recent 50 years or so of the United Nations, look at the issues. I mean, one, just as an example, and we'll move off of this, I'm getting way off target. What's the United Nations think about birth control? Everybody ought to do it. What's the Catholic Church think about birth control? Nobody should do it. I mean, we're, we're coming to the time when they're going to be forced to come in alliance when they are so much in disagreement on so many different things. Uh, let me give you one more disagreement that came up in uh, history recently. This is, this is a good one in my mind. This is significant. They captured Saddam Hussein, right? And if you're paying attention, uh, the Europeans, Europeans, we need to try Saddam Hussein in the world court. Why do the Europeans want to try Saddam Hussein in the world court? Because they don't believe in the death penalty. But the false prophet, the United States, especially George Bush. If you're not familiar, if you're from out of the country, Texas in the United States is more strict on the death penalty than any other state in the United States. You get convicted of death in Texas, you're going to die. <laughs> and so the, it, it, that's pretty much the sentiment in the United States as it is anyway. Texas, the home of George Bush, just to be just a little bit more extreme. But Americans aren't afraid of the death penalty, okay? So when Saddam Hussein was captured, no, the Europeans didn't want the Americans to try him. They didn't want Iraq to try him because Iraq tries, believes in the death penalty too. And what did the papacy come out in that argument? Where, what position did the papacy take? We believe with the Europeans. We don't believe in the death penalty. The papacy doesn't believe in the death penalty. There's the deception, brothers and sisters. Remember, Ahab didn't think Jezebel was going to want to kill Elijah. And Herod didn't think that Salome was going to ask for John the Baptist's head. And today, the United Nations and the papacy are publicly taking the same position on the death penalty. But when the United Nations gives their kingdom to the papacy for a short period of time in order to deal with radical Islam, the first deception the United Nations is going to wake up to is Jezebel don't want to deal with radical Islam. She wants to deal with Seventh-day Adventists. And oh, by the way, we do believe in the death penalty. And that's happening before. Our, that, that argument is happening here and now in the world, if we will but see it. We've been talking about this through. Here's an illustration. The powers in Bible prophecy both have a civil and religious manifestation. You'll notice that as these three powers are portrayed in Bible prophecy many times, that two of the three are in a singular fashion, one of the three is in the plural fashion. Catholicism, its civil manifestation, monarchy, singular. Its religious manifestation, Catholicism, singular. The false prophet, its religion, Protestantism, even when it becomes apostate Protestantism, it's still Protestantism, singular. It's civil manifestation, republicanism, even when it changes to a democracy, it's still the same animal. The dragon power is different. Its civil manifestation is socialism, or communism, or Nazism, or Bolshevism. It's all the different isms that come under the umbrella of socialism. They're just a little different twist. We handed out a book. We handed out a book for this point in this, the presentation. It's called Ecclesiastical Megalomania. You need to read that book. It'll tell you the political um, foundations of the Roman church, and it will give you the very concise, dis distinct differences between socialism, Nazism, communism, and Bolshevism. And there's little differences, but they're all just an extension of Catholicism. The dragon power is a plurality, and its religion, spiritualism, is also a plurality. New Ageism, Buddhism, Hinduism, it's all the isms that come under the umbrella of spiritualism. Two singular, one plural, all three have a religious and civil manifestation. The beast of the beast, dragon, and false prophet is Rome. It is seated upon the seven-hilled city the seven mountains on which the woman is sinneth, woman sitteth. The false prophet is America. The dragon that begins at the plain of Shinar, then moves to Babylon, then moves to Pergamos, then moves to the city of Rome, then encompasses the ten nations of Europe, then the seven European kings, 
And then, remember, the, the dragon power, Rome, the, what, what, what pagan Rome contributed to culture was government. Babylon contributed the sciences, Medes and Persians, finances, Greece, philosophy, pagan Rome, government. They're the government power. The, France was introducing a new type of government. It was, a, it was a little bit of change on Roman government called the beginnings of communism. Later it moves to Russia, the Soviet Union, and then it moves again to the United Nations, and it's a, a clear human example of this move was just watch what Gorbachev did when the Soviet Union fell. He went right into leadership positions in the United Nations. The beast is the one that receives a deadly wound, rules for 1260 years, it persecutes, it changed God's law, it speaks great words, it never changes, and it sits a queen in other characteristics. The false prophets changes from a lamb to a dragon. The two horns change. It ends up speaking as a dragon, which is an action of its legislative and judicial branches. It deceives the world, it exercises the power, and it is the last that persecutes the saints. The dragon moves through history. Multiple manifestations, two singular, one plural. The dragon has multiple manifestations through history. Babel, Babylon, Pergamos, Rome, Europe, France, Soviet Union, United Nations, it moves. And its characteristic is confederacy, the number 10. The 10 in Europe, the 10 kings, the 10 toes, the 10 kings of Psalm 83. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for awakening us to the times in which we're living through your prophetic word. We ask that uh, once again you take these truths and use them to awaken us to our spiritual responsibility to partake fully of your divine nature that uh, people will see you in us and not us in us. Uh, we realize it's preparation day and there may be things that we need to accomplish this day even though it's going to be busy and we ask that you give us uh, wisdom and discernment to get those things ready for the Sabbath. And we thank you for blessing us through this week. It's been a long week. It's no doubt um, hard to even remember all that we've covered, but we know that you wanted us here. So we know that you can bring these things to our remembrance when we need them. And we just thank you and praise you for the work that you've been doing here. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>